Good evening. I am Farah Jasmine Griffin, Chair of African American and African Diaspora Studies here at Columbia University. And I am delighted to welcome you to the first in this semester's book talk series. The series features distinguished authors of works of fiction and nonfiction in conversation about their most recent works with colleagues from the Columbia community. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we hope that you'll return on March 17th when I will be in conversation with the award-winning fiction writer, Danielle Evans. But tonight we are fortunate to have the esteemed social critic and political commentator, Professor Michael Eric Dyson in conversation with our very own Dr. Overy Hendricks. I am honored to introduce both of them to you, not only because they are two thinkers I greatly admire, but because they are family. Obrey Hendricks is visiting professor of religion and African-American and African diaspora studies at Columbia and of biblical ethics at Union Theological Seminary. He is the author of numerous books, including the widely cited Politics of Jesus and the much anticipated forthcoming Christians Against Christianity, How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith, which will be published by Beacon Press in July, 2021. Our distinguished guest, Michael Eric Dyson, is the Centennial Chair and University Distinguished Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies and University Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt University a globally renowned scholar of race, religion, and contemporary culture, Professor Dyson is a frequent media commentator and a prolific author of over 20 books on topics as diverse as race, religion, politics, hip hop, and popular culture. A brilliant thinker and an eloquent speaker, Professor Dyson is a scholar of great breadth and depth, a true wordsmith and a warrior for justice. His genius is evident whenever and however you encounter him, on television screens, as a commentator, on the page, in the classroom, in the pulpit, or in the public square. I also know him to be an incredibly generous and kind friend who I count as a cherished brother. Tonight, Professor Dyson and Professor Hendricks will be in conversation about Professor Dyson's most recent book, the already best-selling, Long Time Coming, Reckoning with Race in America. Please join me in welcoming them. Oh, good evening, good evening. Thank you, Professor Griffin. And good evening, welcome, uh, brother, brother Dyson. Always Thank good you. to be with you. Always be good to be in dialogue with you. It's always provocative and exciting. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here. What a great honor to have this uh, household uh, welcome me, uh, both the household of uh, Columbia University and the uh, Griffin Hendricks household <laughs> as they continue to hold down uh, some of the most dynamic uh, intellectual offerings in the world. How two black geniuses be in one space in the same crib, I, I don't know how that operates, but they're pretty amazing. So it's great to be here with y'all. And, and, and I know you've already done it, so I'm trying to make up because happy belated birthday to the <laughs> Reverend Dr. Professor Farrah Jasmine Griffin. So <laughs> Yeah, brother. Well, so, so nice to have you. And uh, yes, folks, he is a preacher. One can tell. But um, by the way, that's how we do. We, we, as they say, we big each other up, right? <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. But, uh, no, brother, it's, it's really good to, to be in conversation with you. Um, about um, what I, I, I would say is this brilliant book. And I, I, I say that in all sincerity. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's just a brilliant meditation, I think, on, on a number of things. Um, um, underlying, I think, is this meditation on what I might call the cult of death that, that always has attended Black, black life. And, and your treatment of it, I found to be uh, an, an articulate, um, you know, deeply literary, and and deeply moving meditation on 
on black life in the midst of death. And, and but at the same time, I, I read it as a deeply sensitive psycho social analysis mm -hmm. of the factors that inform that cult of death and how it and, and its effects on us, how it affects us. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I read it. And um, that's how I see it. How, how would you characterize the book? Well, I, that's what I'm saying from now on. That, that's, I, ain't, <laughs> I ain't never said them words, but that's how I'm saying it from now. Yes, my book is really a meditation. <laughs> did, I, did I capture, is that the essence? Or you got you... it, Doc. I mean, you named it. You All right, it. all right, right. That's what it is, the cultists of death and mm -hmm. the way in which those cultic dimensions are both iterated, uh, exacerbated, and in some instances amplified by uh, a dominant su white supremacist culture that mm -hmm. is invested in mm -hmm. our death as the price of their advance. Yes, yes, yes. Well, brother, let me ask you a question. Um, I, I, I wanna, um, I wanna be clear. Let's all to be clear on this. And, um, you know, we've all lived our lives, our whole lives, aware of the horror of, you know, the death of, of the horror of, of police terrorism and since Rodney King we've been faced with what you call the lurid pornography of black death um, since Rodney King we've seen it on on video um, we saw it uh, um, in in such vivid detail with uh, Eric Garner but that was seven years ago so, right. what, so so what has moved you in this moment after we've seen so much death what moved you in this particular moment to put pen to paper on the subject? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a great question because in one sense, you look at George Floyd and you say, we've literally seen this movie before. Not metaphorically, not symbolically. We have literally seen this recording before. I can't breathe a big substantial black man being brought down in the case of Eric Garner seven years ago by a contingent and gaggle of malicious cops, the most prominent of which, of whom was Daniel Pantaleo and putting a chokehold on a man, an illegal hold as the man begged to breathe and he was Ignored. <laughs> and then you see George Floyd. And you got to think, Derek Chauvin, you're at least aware enough to know that there's another videotape out here, another recording. You see how old I am, videotape, another recording, another digital record, another mm -hmm. digital imprint mm -hmm. that, that shows cops killing a black man who was literally crying, I can't breathe. And so here it is that, that Derek Chauvin with a kind of uh, blithe indifference, a sadistic disregard for his surroundings, as people claim, don't do this, you're killing them, don't do it. You know, People warning him, you're, you're gonna kill him, you're gonna kill him. And with casual disregard for them, this is, as I say in the book, this is what Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt meant when she talked about you know, the, the banality of evil. And I think we saw it manifest there. So that struck me, man. And and I'm thinking, oh, oh, they don't care. They don't care. It don't make no difference to them. Like, mm -hmm. like if you did it with, we, we already got the, see, it'd be different if, let me find a new way. Because the old way got caught on tape and that was demonized and that was stigmatized and mm -hmm. that's taboo. Let's not do that. Let's figure out another way. Let's, let's get him with a snowblower or mm -hmm. let's throw him into the woods. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to repeat what I saw. That repetition compulsion and psychoanalysis in a neo-Freudian sense is the death of blackness as the price of the advance of white civilization. Mm -hmm. It was produced mm -hmm. to the knee of Chauvin. And I said, I, I can't. I, it just, it, it, look, it angered me in a way. It hurt me in a way. It traumatized me in a way. I, I can't even begin to say. That's why I had to start writing. That, the, mm -hmm. the, the death of George Floyd, the the animalistic pursuit of Ahmad Arbery, and of course, after that, the death of uh, Breonna Taylor, you know, it just got to me. And you would think, Aubrey, that, that you know, after seeing this stuff, and we didn't seen it a, a bunch of times, just seeing the kid in Houston the other day, 
mm. in the snow, walking down the street, and they're messing with him. And it's clear he's going home. What is your point? They release him, right? He spends 24 hours in jail, but then they mm. release him. But the point is they have to they have to flex their muscles. They have to flex their authority. And uh, I just want to use words instead of cussing them out, instead of throwing stuff at the television. I said, let me throw something at the at the screen and let me record my trauma, my hurt, my pain, my anxiety, my grief of what my mourning of black death as it occurs in so many guises. Uh, in the culture. That's what that's what motivated me to uh, to start writing. Let me ask you a sort of an autobiographical question. Um, how much did your personal experiences with police um, inform your writing this book? Yes, sir. It's a great question and a lot. You know, can't lie. When I was a young person, shoot, 14, 15, 16 in Detroit, and back when we were wearing blue jean jackets and blue jean pants. Now that's that sounds square right now, but back if you, if you had a big fro in 19, in the mid 1970s and 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 you had a blue jean jacket and you must be a gang member, man. You must be, you know, you must be tearing stuff up and I never will forget round 74 or thereabouts uh my brother and I were walking on the street and in said clothing <clears throat> and the police stopped him and put him in the police car and i got home to, you know ain't no cell phones called my daddy got my daddy my daddy came around and uh to check them for what the heck they were doing uh to his son and, you know, back and forth and back and forth until it was proved he ain't stole nothing. He ain't doing nothing. And then later on, when we were about 17, driving our father's car because he's working in the factory. And we and a, a friend, it was three of us, three black men. I'm, you know, about 16, 17. They're about 18. And we get stopped by what they call in Detroit, the, the big four. And that's the, uh, you know, unmarked cars, guys in suits. And they're part of what was known as stress. Stop the robberies, enjoy safe streets, right? But it was an acronym, but they were stressing us out because they were doing it at the expense of black people. They got out of that car and they said that we had stolen our car. Now the car had been stolen a while back, but it had been, you know, uh, reported uh, missing. But here we are, was, I said, let me show you that I have a registration for the car. The cop extracts a gun from his holster, puts it to my head and says, nigga, if you move again, I'll blow your effing brains out. Mm. Hit mm. me, knock me on the ground, knock my friend Jones on the ground. My other brother Anthony didn't get knocked on the ground. Mm. And uh, they ran the tags, all that stuff they do. And when they discovered it was our car and we, it was legal and we were all right, do you think they apologized? No. Do you think they said, I'm sorry? No. Did they say, all right, be on your way, forgive us, nothing. Got in their car and then drove off. So, you know, that, you know, and a bunch of other uh, mm -hmm. encounters with the police definitely has shaded and shaped my perception of what the police have been to black people, at least to a lot of black people I know, mm -hmm. and their disregard uh, for us, that not caring who we are, at what level we are, what our achievements are. They don't care. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it did, it did, uh, it did inform what I wrote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that sort of comes out in the book, that, you know, how, how much you are sensitized that it gives you a lens and angle of, of, of uh, a lens and angle vision to which to see this more clearly, I, I think, you know, you don't have any, um, any illusions Mm -hmm. uh at, at all about what policing is about and it's, and you are very i think you take a very balanced approach here you you know you're fair but you're but you are uh you're authentic about it you know you don't pull any punches and so this this bring this this raises this question to me you you use a term in here when you talk about emmett till the chapter on emmett till mm -hmm. you know um i mean that was such a that continues to be a, a terrible trauma in the life of black people even oh, today. Today, I mean, uh, I mean, 
to even today. And then you talk about slow terror and fast terror. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. Unpack that for us a little, if you would. Yes, sir. So for me, fast terror, bombs dropping. Tulsa, Oklahoma getting burnt down to the ground. Rosewood getting slaughtered. Um, black people under assault by the police. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery being hunted down. That's fast terror. We can see it. It's powerful. It's explosive. It's immediate. It's acute. Mm -hmm. But slow terror is stuff that's much more subtle. You know, what happened in Ferguson when they were ripping off uh, all those citizens there who were black by, by forcing them to pay all these fines. $45, $50 here. Yeah, that's why they didn't want to deal with the police because they were fining them for no good reason. $100, $150 here for no good reason. Slow terror. Make their budget. Make their budget. Uh, <clears throat> kids being kicked out of school. Young black kids, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. Slow terror. Just, just, just every day on the radar, a register of trauma and offense, not big and explosive, except when the police taser a, a nine-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. So it's the subtle, uh, but nonetheless menacing presence of racial animus and hostility that part that are part of what we call, quote, microaggressions mm -hmm. uh, part that continue to really nip at the heels of, of black people, just as destructive, just as negative, but in their accumulated effect, mm -hmm. in their slow rolling effect, they have a devastating impact on, uh, on black America. And talk about that impact as you see it, Lee. You talk about it in the book. And uh, I think you do a really good job on that talk, talking about um, the toll, <clears throat> the, the daily insults, the death of a thousand cuts, yeah. um, the, the, the deep pain that we feel at times that sometimes we become even numb to. Could you, could yeah. you just talk a little about the effects yeah. that you see of, of this terror on, yeah. on us and on our children? That's a great point. Look, there's a huge generational divide, I think, between those of us who are the Jones generation, right? Right after the, the, the boomers, the Jones are like 54. I'm born in 58. So to about, you know, the, the age when Generation X comes in. So boomers, gen, gener, Generation Jones, those of us <clears throat> out here, the struggle between our perception of how race operates and our response and say millennials with the Black Lives Matter is a big thing. We ain't had no conception of self-care. I don't care what this is. We just ain't, that, that wasn't germane to our culture to nurture that. Now, I'm not saying that black people didn't have a, a way of looking out for, but the language itself, <clears throat> excuse me, draws attention to the ritualistic self-regard that is not merely written off as self-enclosed narcissistic self-preoccupation. It's about the healthy, acknowledgement that pain and trauma will hurt you and that too much exposure will have a particular effect. So I'm in class one day and I'm, you know, I'm about to show the Kendrick Lamar video. We going to be all right. And it's about police brutality. Mm -hmm. And my TA goes, Dr. Dyson, do, do you think you should issue a trigger warning? <laughs> I said, here's the trigger warning. The cop got a gun and he going to pull that trigger. Right? That was trigger warning in my generation. Like, watch out for that alley app. Which was, which was, which, watch out. Yeah. Trigger warning? That was what it was about to, to murk you. So I was like, oh, well, damn. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I guess so. And then, mm -hmm. Because it didn't occur to me that that would be the case. Now, a lot, of, but see, this is how young people get written off. So you're snowflakes. You're too hypersensitive. You wokeness people are so fragile. You can't deal with anything. Now, I'm not saying there's no legitimate critique of certain extremes, but I will say, for the most part, that kind of self care is important. And and, and in my generation, you know, we joke at first. Dr. King didn't stop on the way to Selma to get a pedicure, right? Ha 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 ha. And when you think about the fact that when King had an autopsy done 
at 39, he had the heart of a 65 year old man. Now, since I'm getting close to that, I hope that means it's really good. <laughs> but the point is at 39, you shouldn't have no 65 year old heart. Mm -hmm. And the pressure and the struggle, and think about Gandhi who said, no, 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 I gotta take care of myself because if I take care of me, and if I'm good for me, I'll be good for you. So that kind of sensitivity toward trauma uh, is ex especially important because in my generation and earlier, we saw it. We saw the blank eyed stare. Mm -hmm. We saw the, the mm -hmm. reaction of black people to the trauma that we can't you know, even um, imagine another way out that it, it, the, the velocity of viciousness mm -hmm. has claimed us in such a destructive fashion that there's nothing we can do to interrupt it. Right, or, or we just turn away and pretend it didn't exist. But the beauty of self-care is in the midst of the hurt, the pain, the trauma, we carve a niche of self-regard that is inevitably politicized in the way that all black love is political in a white supremacist culture that teaches us to despise and hate each other. So what, what would that look like in, in practical terms? I mean, what does self-care look like in practical terms? A couple you examples. Know, yeah, well, they, they for giving them trigger warnings. Don't don't watch. Look, some people say I'm not gonna watch that. I'm not gonna watch that. Uh, the video of um, Ahmad Arbery being hunted down. I'm not going to uh, expose myself to the video of Daniel Prude having a spit hood put on his head mm, mm, mm. in the midst of a psychotic break. Naked, and but naked. naked. I mean, how metaphoric is that? You're, you're a, a biblical genius and stuff. You could deconstruct that in terms of the nakedness and what that meant. I think about the, 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 the demoniac at Gadarenes, or however you pronounce it. Mm -hmm, right. And, 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 and my pastor, Captain Mark. Yes, Doc. Mm -hmm. Hence. So, and my pastor would say, uh, uh, it's all right to visit a graveyard, but you ain't got no business making it your address. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> them old preachers, Doc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that they arrest the development of intimate contact with fragility in order to protect themselves for the long run. And so that means don't look at no videos. Uh, not, not, eventually, they may look at it, but in the care of others, as we weep and grieve, that's mm -hmm. what self care or self care says. You know what? I'm not going, you know, all this mad. I'm not going to go on Twitter for five days. Mm. <laughs> I'm mm. not going to listen to the, the bull crap, the hate, because let's be honest. Mm. The, the irony is the same generation that gave us self-care has given us such reckless disregard for the other at the same time. So it's a paradox. There's altruism expressed in the, in the admonishment to be self-regarding and self-caring, Mm -hmm. Yet we're in a social media landscape that does anything but that. It eviscerates. Oh. It, oh, it, yeah. it, it inundates it. us. Inundates us. Oh my God. Yeah. So that's yeah. one of those are a couple of ways. Okay. Yeah. One way is also not to listen to the voice of Donald Trump. That's that triggers everybody, that? right? How about that? How about that? That's so well, well, let me ask you. Um You talk about the black, the, the juxtaposition uh, of the black next and the white again. Right? Um, and I mean, I think that's that's very important because that's that sort of seems to be to underlie um, this whole this whole race, racist phenomenon. Yes. Sir. Talk about the black next and the white. Uh, again a little because I, I i like the way you, you broke that down doc that was thank you man you one of the very few people man james peterson when i was talking to him and a dude on radio in philly the only two people who've ever asked me that right and i'm just so that's <laughs> like thank you because i i think it is um uh, hopefully uh an elucidatory uh concept that helps us explain what the heck's going on so to me, the black next is the perennial preoccupation with the creativity of blackness, both in terms of social struggle and in terms of aesthetic articulation, aesthetic expression, culture. So 
you know, you're going you're gonna to take our spirituals, we get you the blues. You take our blues, we get you, you know, uh, uh, jazz. You take our jazz, we, we, we get you rock and roll. You take our rock and roll, we get you uh, R&B. You take our R&B, we get you soul. You take soul, we get you hip hop. You can't rip off hip hop. <laughs> you, they, they ain't successfully ripped that off yet. So yeah. whatever people want to say about hip hop, they the Negroes done finally came up with something. <laughs> ain't but Eminem and a couple other white boys been able to crack. <laughs> so I mean jazz too in a way, but there are many more participants of mm -hmm. you know who are white who are doing a great job with jazz. Yeah. So right. the thing is, is that it's the constant, right? Next. The greatest word in black creativity is next. The greatest word in black culture is next. It's the key word. Uh, for us, but not only that, but also but, in politics and, and political social, aspiration, right? Yes, social struggle, politics, and inspiration. Mm -hmm. Because we're saying, no matter what you do, we're coming again. No mm -hmm. matter what you say, the next thing, the next step, mm -hmm. the next, uh, the mm -hmm. next condition, the next mm -hmm. leader, the next group of people. There the will next, be a, a, the next. There will be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. Mm -hmm. And so that's juxtaposed to the white again. Mm -hmm. Slavery, we want that again. Post Reconstruction, we want that again. Mm -hmm. uh, Confederacy, we want that again. Uh, Jim Crow, we want that again. Uh, mm -hmm. The plantation, we want that again. Uh, separate but equal, we want that again. Uh, the de facto versus de jure segregation, we want that again. Now you talk about that in regard to the police. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely right. You're such a thorough reader. My God, I'm just not used to this. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah absolutely. Because the police are again the manifestation of, you know, from the 1703, I think it was, of 04 in Virginia, where the uh, slave patrols are initiated. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying there's an exact one-on-one -on -one relationship between the slave patrols and the police, but in this country, the pedigree of policing is derivative from a history that is tied directly to slave patrols. Because what was their point? They had to contain Negroes who were out of order. They were trying to get Black people at night to submit to their own vicious invective and their epithets and their indictment of our bodies and at many points, they killed us to collect us, to take us back to where they thought we ought to be because we mm -hmm, were mm -hmm. out of place. Mm -hmm. That's what the police are doing mm -hmm. in many instances uh, at this day and time. And so it's the neck, it's the white again. It's the mm -hmm. assertion that this will happen again and again. And, and here's the thing, I didn't even put this in the book, but subtly in one sentence, make America great again is yeah. the apotheosis of that very chain mm -hmm. of being. Yes, 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 yes. Um, you, um, I recall, and you talk about the political economy of night um, for black folks. Ain't nobody but, Jim, again, only Peterson asked me, ain't you the second person ever <laughs> to ask me about that, ever. And I you said, know, I think, that was a, that. I think that's I'm a great- I'm working that, man. That's a great point. I've never heard that before, man. And you I, know- I came up with it, Doc. I'm not gonna, I mean, if you ask me, I mean, just as a matter of pride, the white next, the, the black next and the white again, and then the political economy at night, I was like, man, I'm just- Talk about that for a minute. Talk about that for a minute. <laughs> I think that's very germane to us today. Oh man, that's what I, thank you for saying that. Because that's what, that was my point, right? For me, the political economy at night is, what happened when black people, enslaved black people are forced to try to come to grips with the humiliating denial of their freedom, the rejection of their possibility as humane creatures on earth. So they got to dance, they got to, they got to sing, they got to do stuff for white folk and they found every way they could to interrupt it. They mm -hmm. broke the holes that they used to till the soil. They broke the legs of the animals that were supposed to be used in their work. Now, don't don't say, well, this is why black people, uh, you know, are horrible. Peter going to come after us. Well, mm -hmm. Peter, uh, the thing is, one of the reasons why I, I joke sometimes, one of the reasons why black people ain't deep as deep into the animal rights movement as they, they could be or should be, because the animals were jacking us up in history. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the animals were being used in a destructive way. The bicuspids and incisors of police dogs are ripping at our flesh in Birmingham in 63. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. why Ren 1010 is on TV. Last mm. got a show, 
Mr. <laughs> Ed got a show. A horse, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> you remember that. You remember oh, yeah. that. A horse is a oh, horse, yeah. of course, of course. Right? <laughs> Matt King Cole can't stay on TV for a year. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, so, mm -hmm. so Mr. Mm -hmm. Ed, a horse, a collie, Lassie, Ren Tin Tin, a German Shepherd. Oh, and, and Big Ben, right? <laughs> yes. Ben, yeah, right. With the bear. You got a bear. You got a bear, two dogs, and a horse. And God darn it, if we throw in my mother the car. Let's just <laughs> that, that the man's car was talking. It was his mama as a car. All of these sentient beings and these inanimate, inanimate objects could exist, but black people couldn't even be recognized on television. So, so my point is economy and night that we were forced to find our temporary escape from enslavement through the freedom that it permitted us. Um, so they, they, you know, one of the, the slave uh, slavers and overseers called, he said, nighttime is the niggas daytime, right? The nigga daytime is nighttime. Because they come alive. And it was so funny. Like, them dark as sure do come alive at night now. They do nothing during the damn day for 12 hours. <laughs> but when they come the darker, when they're going to see their sweethearts, right? Mm -hmm. All this mess about the black family and how jacked up we are, they were going to see their sweethearts on different plantations, or mm -hmm. if they were in an urban situation in another place, mm -hmm. uh, they were going fishing, they were mm -hmm. going hunting, mm -hmm. they were going to church. So the recreational activities that they were allowed, and a lot of people who don't study slavery, like you do as a scholar of Fair mm -hmm. Griffin and mm -hmm. others, don't even know that, wait a minute, Negroes get off the planet? Oh yeah, they had passes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why, you know, when, when, when Obama was president, we acting like you trying to act like he's a Negro who got to show his past. Like, mm -hmm. like he on he off the plantation by permission of the white man. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they would, the, the slave master would issue or the uh, overseer would issue mm -hmm. a pass. And if mm -hmm. you didn't have that pass, the slave patrol would jack you up. Mm -hmm. And then the slave masters got mad if, if one of the slave patrol killed one of the enslaved uh, human beings, then they would sue them. For, for destroying the property, right? Come on, the mm -hmm. only people who got reparations in this country around race are white folks. Mm -hmm. Ain't that, that a trick? Ain't, Ain't that, that a trick? So simple. anyway, so well, I, the relationship between the police and the and the patrollers and the political economy at night. You were saying yeah. that um, the political. So during the day, the, the folk moved as slowly as as they were able to slowly. without having to pay a price for it. That's right. It was. That's right. That's right. That's right. We came alive at night, and and when we came alive. Is when they uh, uh, when the when the patrols really came alive. That's exactly that right. That's a great point. That's a great great point to make. That when we got most alive and free, the patrols got most energized and mm. aggressive. Mm. Now, for a while, it was held off because if you had that pass, you know, mm. the Lord knows if you made up one of them passes, and you know, <laughs> you know, we like like uh, Mama, this is my good grades, or you make a pass, a hall pass that the teacher wrote and you forged it. Yeah, they were forging, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but Darky D is able to go for the night, so, mm -hmm. so some of that was going on. And if the slave patrol caught them, it was hell to pay, and mm -hmm. they were vicious mm -hmm. and they were destructive. So, so yeah, but I came up with the term the political economy of night because there was an entire order of existence that black people were organizing that, and they were stealing pigs and hogs. They were going to the, some of them who escaped, either they had people who left for the promised land, so to speak, and, and went to freedom up North, or they had the Maroons. Yeah. Oh, I ain't leaving. I'm gonna stay right here. Cause mm -hmm. I miss my family. I love the people. But so they hung out in the woods. Mm -hmm. and, and it was bordering some of these plantations. So they were stealing at night and some of the enslaved people who were in the kitchen left the door open so they could mm -hmm. come in. I mean, we hooked each other up in a mm -hmm. very fundamental way. Mm -hmm. And then they got food. So they stole back in the slave. The enslaved people had an ingenious explanation. They said, look, we, they done stole us and, mm -hmm. and, and made us in the property. And since the, the pigs are property, Pro property can't steal property, so I'm taking that darn thing. I mean, they were intellectually very sophisticated, up there, right? That's Karl Marx one on one. <laughs> in a very serious way. So I said, the political economy night is where black people take back their lives, rescue their dignity, um, feel a temporary relief from enslavement, claim their freedom, and create entire orders of being and social networks that allow them to thrive. And as you said, 
That's their thrive to this day. What we've done at night, what we've done away from the white overseeing, what we do away from official white society. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. the economy night is all about. And, and that's when, what do you call the, 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 uh, the blue um, plague comes yeah. alive, right? Uh, yeah. When we come alive, they come alive. What do you call that? Referred swagger. Is that what you call referred swagger? That's right. That's right. That's right. Because they ain't got it on their own. So they got to they got to get it derivatively, you know, from uh, seeing other body else. They can't be Aubrey Hendrix with his, you know, cold blooded. What's up, man? I'm from the streets with a black belt. I could kick your butt at any point. So I'm 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 satisfied in my own skin. I'm mellow and cool. Now, now the white guy come along with like, well, how can I be Aubrey Hendrix? I I don't know. Now I'm not trying to stigmatize or stereotype all white guys. There's some cool white people. That's but you get my point. The point is generally there was an there was a there was a kind of avarice uh, mm. and, and a kind of envy about black who, whether it was Obama, whether it was Miles Davis, um, you know, and, and we talk about, it's not that black women can't be cool. There are so many cool, black. I mean, Angela Davis, mm. you know, in the 90s is, is, is the epitome of what it means to be cool under fire and assault. I mean, that's right? right, that's right. So, so there, there was the kind of recognition of black style and its projection and the way in which if they didn't have it themselves, they had to have referred swagger. So that's what I was talking about there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see that in, in cops. And it's like, uh, 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 you know, the, the culture is they have to, well, they have to have, they have to have that swagger. And, and a lot of it has to do, that, do with fear, of course. And, but resentment um, for us, you know, to assert ourselves to be somebody. They get angry if you look them in the eye. Oh my you stand God. up and like, I'm as much man as you are. You just happen to have a gun. You yeah. know, now, I mean, you can't, you say that to him, boy, it's you got hell oh to pay. My God. But, but let me ask you, Mike, you, well, you that's said- That's a great point you wait. Can I say something though? Yeah, please. Oh, see, very few people who are scholars, and this is why, and I don't want to elevate the streets in a certain way, because you and I come from them, but the difference it makes for you being from the streets to know that point right there, almost intuitively. Like, mm -hmm. don't let it be, you know, uh, without a badge and a gun, you can't get none, as they said it after police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you can't get none, right? And that's why I, I blew that song. When you talk about the existential stakes I have in this, I remember in 1989, 88, 89, when after police come, came out, after police, I was teaching at Hartford Seminary. I was blasting that. I was blasting that out the window. After police coming straight from the underground, a young brother got it bad because I'm brown and not the other color. So mm. police think they have the authority to kill a minority. Mm. I mean, there it is right there, man. Mm -hmm. They sum it up in poetic uh, cadence and verse. Mm. Uh, mm. But that, that feeling that, that, that's the feeling I had when I saw that cop tasering that nine-year-old girl. Trust mm. somebody your own size, homie. Mm. Take your mm. gun off and mm. take your badge mm. off and come at this 233 pounds right here. And let me see what you got there. Tell me about it. Tell me. You know, it's so hard. It's, it's so, I mean, in reading the book, I mean, for one thing, brother, it's, um, um, I mean, I don't know how you wrote it. I mean, you must've cried a whole lot writing this book because you read so deeply, man, to, uh, to, to be in touch uh, with, with the pain, and you also, you know, you you look at it from, from from multiple angles. I mean, and you look at it from the angle of of a uh, of the victimized dead, um, and look at 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 all their lives meant, what was lost, what what potential was was lost, all the factors that that uh, that 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 surround their lives, but also um, all of the the factors that surround those. Who was you know who sailed and assaulted them, man? I mean, it's 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 really brilliant and and holistic in in so many ways. And I'm 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 not even going to ask you what it did to you in writing it because I I know it must have been uh it must have been extremely uh, painful. Well, I will ask you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're you're so right, man. What's that Jay Z song, uh, No Hook, on the American Gangster album where he talks about the where he buried the pain? These lyrics are where the ashes are buried. Mm. So. So it's mm. yeah, it's it's in those lyrics. It's in it's on mm. that page. I you mm. know when they say leave it on the on the field and leave it in the page, man. I bled on that page, bro. No, you did. Yeah, the, you did. Uh, hurt the terror. I'm I'm gonna tell you when I wrote that. Um, and I, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I wrote it last. I wrote the the Elijah McLean prelude last. Oh, really? We just saw, was it? That was, brother, that was so 
Oh, that just tore me up, man. Brother, I tell you, I'm not gonna lie to you. I had tears in my eyes, I had, on my cheek. Because Let, to mm, see mm, that young man, 23 years old, and mm, they just mm, issued the report yesterday, 157 pages. They had no right to stop the kid. They had no they had no compelling reason to do so. He's 23 years old, arguably on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. He played his violin for the pigeons and birds. Mm -hmm. the, his co-worker said he had a gold orb around him. Mm -hmm. Over, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what broke me. That when he's begging them, please don't respect the how did he put it beautifully? Respect the boundaries I am speaking. Exactly. I mean, how biblical is that, man? How you could deacon, how biblical is that? And then he says, he says, Hey, I wouldn't hurt anybody. He starts identifying with them. I know you don't mean any harm. You're, yes. you're good people, you're good people, right? This is where the politics of respectability are proved so evidently can't hurt help us because no matter his deep and profound humanity, they kept hurting this boy. He's yes. 146 uh, pounds, six, a uh, five, four, five foot six, uh, you know, and, and he couldn't hurt a fly. And they rendered him unconscious twice. He, he hadn't done anything, and you know, and brother, the Nothing. way you wrote this, 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 this prelude, gold orb, you call it, man, it is just, I, I told Sarah, this, this is just, this is just so brilliant, man, it just tore me up, and you know, the fact that you go through it um, point by point, every, the things that he said, um, mm -hmm. and what was happening as he was saying them, he said, um, I have no gun, I don't do that stuff, mm -hmm. um, I don't do any fighting. Mm. Why are you attacking me? I don't even kill flies. Oh. I don't eat meat. Oh my Jesus. Oh man, oh my God. It's just, uh, so okay. I mean, I, I know it, it had to it had to tear, tear you apart uh, yeah, to write it. I must tell those of you who are listening, it is some of the most brilliant writing that I have seen in, uh, in, in a long, in a long time. And some of the most touching I've seen a long time, but brother, I think uh, maybe this might be a good place to go to questions, man, because that just that just tore my heart out, man. Oh uh, my God, man! Think, thinking about me. thinking about that. Um, let's. Uh, how we're going to do this? I think that I will go to the chat. Okay. And uh, whew, let me catch my breath. I'm mm -hmm. telling y'all, you read this book. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, <clears throat> Catherine Ellington asks, how do we all heal and become whole together? Um, mm -hmm. where, where does this happen and what is the next space? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question. You know, we can only heal if there's knowledge. We can only heal if there's truth. It's just like, and, and I was very explicit about my support for Joe Biden over against Donald Trump. There's only two choices. It was right. Trump. Or Biden, and I don't care. I was, I was like, let's get this guy out of office. What Obrey said earlier, I think some of y'all missed that. Like, self care is not hearing this guy's voice. After January sixth, listen to the depth of the implication of what Professor Hendricks just said, right? Because that voice resonates, and we're still still hearing it. Even even Mitch, uh, I mean um, um, uh, Romney, excuse me, Romney says. That Mitt Romney, that uh, likely the likelihood is that Trump can win in 2024. Yeah, that he probably will be the leading figure, which is damnable. It's a damnable thing, and it's a damning indictment of that party because they've been captive to him. But anyway, you can't. But but the thing about uh, with President Biden, I love the the point of unity, but I think that unity is the bridge. The destination is justice. So the people in the Capitol were unified, but for a bad purpose. So unity by itself can never be sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. Unity is the, the, the Edmund Pettus bridge is the means toward a bigger end. The bigger end was John Lewis and Amelia Boynton going over to a broader uh, participation in uh, enfranchisement by getting the, the black vote in 1965. So for me, when I think about healing, healing comes from acknowledging the pain, the trauma, the hurt, and having that acknowledged in a society that has hurt you. Mm. Right? It's one thing for us to retreat into our own enclaves, mm -hmm. our own wounds. 
Mm -hmm. um, but this is something different to, to have that acknowledged in the dominant culture. And I think for, for a moment, that flashed after the death of George Floyd with the participation of white brothers and sisters yeah. in the movements. Because look, you can't sell 10 million records if you a black artist without white folk buying a lot of your records. And mm -hmm. you can't have the biggest protest movement in history without a lot of white folk being involved and Latinx and yeah. Asian and indigenous yeah. people. Yeah. So the yeah. thing is, they got the point at that point. They got, they got the message. And I think on that day, white folk for the first time, many of them fell in love with black people. No judgment here, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you for the first time, yeah. I think many white people went, damn, uh, look, there's no asterisk here. Th they were all removed. Uh, what do they usually say about us? Oh, you were running away from the cops. He was under the knees of three cops. Oh, you were probably cussing them out. He kept saying officer and sir. Oh, you were probably being belligerent. No, he was, he was being very kind. Yeah. Uh, so then they said, oh, wait a minute. He did all that and you still killed him? I think white folks said enough is enough. Yeah, so yeah. The healing begins when there's truth telling and mm -hmm. there's an acknowledgement of the hurt and pain that black people have endured. And it mm -hmm. happens in corporate structures. It happens mm -hmm. in communities, centers. It happens in classrooms. And it can happen, hopefully, in some of our religious organizations as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Well, this next question um, is, I think, is good one to follow this. Is Do you think that we're going through a second reconstruction your comments um, suggest that we're experiencing so much again, knowing now what knowing now what will be next. What do you think? Do you think we will respond differently now? Yeah, this is this is the white again versus the black next writ large, right? Mm. Um, and you know the the second reconstruction has been talked about before. Uh, of course, I think if you listen to Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, speaking about what happened with the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and the attempt to rejigger uh, the forces of American democracy and really uh, heal the schisms that so bitterly divided us. But in, in, in the metaphoric sense, of course, you know, a black reconstruction in the sense that it's a small period of time where black people were able to seize authority, gain political representation, and yet it evoked the most horrid sense of revenge on the part of the masses of white people. And we saw it on January 6th. Look at what happened on three successive Tuesdays, the insurrection, the inauguration, and the impeachment. That is in precis, the story of America at this level. Uh, the insurrection where out of control white supremacists who were being called before that day, patriots, Mm -hmm. Colin Kaepernick bends his knee on a gridiron and is seen as one of the worst figures in the history of America to many white folk. Mm -hmm. And these people who are secessionists, mm -hmm. the bitter banner of bigotry hanging above their heads, taking the Confederate flag and flowing it through the Capitol, the most sacred civic space in America, the Capitol, joined with the most hallowed hall of power, the Oval Office, together to undermine American democracy. Mm -hmm. That is the reconstruction writ large against the canvas of human history. And the white supremacists uh, are articulating their ideals and their norms and their aspirations through organized politics. And, and I'll end by saying this, here's the most horrible part about it, is that the same way they went around, like in, you know, um, you know say North Carolina, when they're just killing people, or you know, later on, that was in 1919, then you think about the bloody summer and you think about what happened earlier in 1909 and you think about what happened in 1898 mm -hmm. there in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, think about this, that they were killing people for trying to do the right thing. They say, black people don't wanna vote. We're trying to vote, you're killing us. Trying mm -hmm. to vote, you're burning us down. Trying to mm -hmm. vote, you're looting our neighborhoods. And so what's interesting is that the, the Republican party is now captive of white supremacists and Mitch McConnell, is as dangerous and destructive. Mitch McConnell is slow white supremacy. Donald Trump is fast white supremacy. Mm -hmm. But they're both the same. You know, if you listen to your cell phone, like right now, it's on, it's on, uh, it's probably on uh, silent. Well, if your phone rings loud, you can hear it. Hello, hello. If the phone is silent and you don't hear it, it's still a call being made. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you hear it 
is, is up to how you got your phone set. But whether it's on silent or vibrate or loud, a call is still being registered, mm -hmm. just as effective. And so white supremacy in this second or third, you know, post reconstruction it, that's happening to us is just as real and devastating and as dangerous as now. And the Josh Hawley's and the Marjorie Greens, mm -hmm. and you know, and Hawley ought to know better with all that darn education from the Ivy League, but it don't make no difference. Cruz. Martin Luther King Jr. said, you, you know, some of the worst people in the world have been some of the smartest. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think that, yeah, we're living through uh, such a period and we have to be ever vigilant about understanding the historic record and the parallels. And what we do is, you know, deepen our awareness, broaden our horizon of interpretation of what we're going through, but this too, join hands, and connect with all black people. Mm -hmm. so the notion that Black Lives Matter has to be first taken seriously by us. Mm -hmm. oh, that's trans, oh, that's gay, or oh, that's lesbian, mm -hmm. or oh, that's poor, or oh, that's single mama, or mm -hmm. oh, that's ill. We got to all understand how to heal yeah. the divisions in our own community and yeah. love each other. You know what? I mean, that's it's wonderful. It's, it's just so wonderful for me. And uh, at this point in my career, I've been uh, teaching for decades now. Um, to hear that white students are comfortable talking about white supremacy. Yeah. There was yeah. a time when it was a sort of an uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable subject because folks felt like they were being indicted maybe or, or fingers were being pointed. But now people are able to stand back and see it um, for the phenomenon that it is that's about domination. Yeah. And it's not about race. Race is just, uh, just a tool for it. So, that, so it's a very hopeful time. That's a brilliant point when you said white supremacy is not about just race in the same way rape is not about sex but power. Yeah. yeah. White supremacy is about the assertion of power. Yes. Because King reminded us white supremacy is going to destroy white people. Yeah, yeah. January yeah. 6th. There mm -hmm. it is right there. It, it don't get no plainer than that. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's a question that uh, might be right up your alley. It's Dr. Dyson. How do you feel the black church can be relevant spiritually and economically to our people during this pandemic and beyond yeah no it's a great point well you you're talking you see me talking to one of the greatest scholars we've ever produced in our history i ain't saying that oh. i said it <laughs> i said it behind his back too and i can't wait to read his next book he, mm. he he dropped every time he's dropping a book he's dropping a classic and that uh the politics of jesus if you have not read it please 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 don't buy my book go buy that book and <laughs> read that book if you ain't got but one book then read that book. But let me tell you what's important. Oh, you're kind, you're kind. I'm telling the truth, man. And I'm telling y'all what's important um, about the black church. You know, Robert McAfee Brown, great theologian, used to be out at uh, Berkeley uh, Graduate Theological Union. Mm -hmm. Robert McAfee Brown said, the church is like Noah's Ark. If it wasn't for the storm on the outside, you couldn't stand the stink on the inside. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the mm -hmm. thing is, is that, yeah, the black church got some problems. It's, it's, it's stanky up in here. But bruh, it's a storm outside. Mm -hmm. And this black church, as you saw with Skip Gates' special uh, that was on, I think, last week, mm -hmm. uh, the black church has been a haven and a wonderful, uh, you know, refuge in a time of trouble for so many of us. Yeah, it's got a lot of trouble. Yeah, it's got a lot of problems. Yeah, it's got a lot of jacked up stuff. But the beauty and the power of our souls are revealed there. And the, and the performances that allowed us to sustain ourselves, preaching, singing, mm -hmm. reminding each other of our worth, that, mm -hmm. that during the week, they might treat you like a piece of trash, but on Sunday morning, you were Deacon Williams yes. and you were Sister uh, McKendrick and you were, you had dignity and you want, white folk could afford to wear their, their uh, weekday clothes to church because they were already being treated like they had Sunday clothes on, on Monday. That's but right. People right. didn't have that. So we came to church in our Sunday best. The only place we could be somebody. Come on, Doc. Only place, except Speak in our on. homes. Speak on it, Doc. Speak mm -hmm. on it. So, so there, uh, and, it, and it was the intimate kinship, right? The, the, the kind of fictive kinship that Carol Stack talks about anthropologically so and ethnographically. So yeah, it's important that the Black church remain so powerful. Look, you, you're looking at two guys who have been extremely critical of the black church. Trust and believe on that. <laughs> but you're talking, you talking to two brothers who have been produced by it, who love it, who have given our lives to it, who have preached in that church. This man was a seminary president. Mm -hmm. Hear what I'm saying to you. 
So we have, we got skinned, and I've been, I didn't pass the three churches, got kicked out of a church for trying to ordain three women as deacons, mm -hmm. a black church. Mm -hmm. Had a mm -hmm. black woman in Cleveland tell me two years ago, at, after preaching, she said, you know you're going to hell. That true mm -hmm. story, she said, you know you're going to hell. <laughs> I, said, I know 25 reasons why I should, I'm not going to lie to you, but I'm just curious about one of the reasons you know. <laughs> I thought my phone was locked and ain't nobody got access to my crib. So I'm not sure what you think. She says, don't be smart. You know why you're going to hell. She says, because you preach this morning that God made gay people. I yeah. said, wait a minute. And you think I'm going to hell? And you're a polytheist? Because you think there's a God for straight people and a God for gay people. I said, what did God take a break on Wednesday? And said, this creation is hard. I need, a, I need to rest, God dang it, because it is hard. So on that day, God made gay people? No, somebody else made them? Because God was off? And so the, the substitute right. deity made gay people? Stop. Stop it. So, yeah. so my yeah. thing is, yes, a lot of harm goes on there, but the beauty and the power and the redemption and the salvation that we feel. Is, but what can we do? What can the churches do though? And, and well, uh, yeah. and, I mean, in this in this moment with this plague of police terrorism and barbarism uh, and the pan and the pandemic. Uh, invite Aubrey Hendricks to preach at your church on Sunday mornings. Listen to my preacher over here, Howard John Wesley. Listen to Frederick Douglass Haynes the third in Dallas, Gina Stewart in Memphis, Lance Watson. In Virginia, uh, Marcus Cosby in uh, Houston, and Carolyn Knight, and, and on and on. The best of our prophetic Black preaching tradition will hold these folk accountable, and not just hold them accountable, but actually get involved. If you look at uh, Instagram and, and Twitter, when Frederick Douglass Haynes, Freddie Haynes, was actually um, you know, in conversation with and in some real resistance uh, to people who tried to jack his church and use it for a B Blue Lives Matter uh, kind of rally. And he's yeah, literally they, physically there on the ground. Yeah, they came to take it over. Mm -hmm. Come on, Doc. Mm -hmm. And so we need Black churches on the ground doing the thing, standing up for Black people, registering them to vote, making sure that they have mental health facilities and mm -hmm. services. Stop mm -hmm. telling Black people all they need is Jesus. Stop lying. Mm -hmm. Jesus said when the disciples came to him, and I'm talking to one of the most brilliant biblical scholars in the land, uh, when they said, Jesus, we could not cast out this demon. And Jesus says, that kind only comes from what? From uh, prayer and mm -hmm. fasting and, mm -hmm. and Prozac. Jesus mm -hmm. said, thou needest chemicals, right? Thou needest <laughs> chemicals because your brain is out of whack. It's, right? Would we be ashamed to go to the doctor if we had a broken leg? Tiger Woods got in a bad accident yesterday. Is it shameful mm -hmm. that, oh my God, they took him to the hospital? Why is it mm -hmm. shameful for us to have a broken brain and a mm -hmm. broken spirit mm -hmm. and to take ourselves? This is what self-care is about, too, is understanding we need therapy and we need intervention. So those are some of the things that the Black church can do. Register folk to vote, speak up for the least and the lost and the lonely, mm -hmm. go visit the widow, go visit people in the hospitals and, you know, talk to Black people about the skepticism over science mm -hmm. and the vaccine. Mm -hmm. We ought to come up with something called a Black scene. <laughs> mm -hmm. have black people well, I'm getting the black scene today, like yeah. they in the corner selling drugs. So the thing is, excuse me, y'all. So the thing is this, is that, yes, you know, when I talk on these shows and you talk on these shows, look, black people ain't afraid of science. Mm -hmm. We're afraid of scientists. Mm -hmm. We ain't afraid of medicine. We're afraid of doctors. Mm -hmm. We want the medicine. We want the science. We just don't want the manipulation by mm -hmm. unprincipled scientists and physicians who yeah. will do the Tuskegee experiment. Anybody? How about mm -hmm. Henrietta Lacks up the road here in Baltimore, where mm -hmm. they harvested the, the cells of her body, making billions of dollars uh, for biological enterprises. So my point is mm -hmm. that if we can speak to the skepticism that's legitimate uh, of, of those vaccinations to get vaccinations, and then say this ain't the same as white folk and their conspiracy theories and their QAnons trying to demonize uh, progressive scientifically based uh, theories and hypotheses about how we heal the body. Those are the kind of things I think the Black Church can do. Well, we're going to, we're going to, we're sort of running out of time. I want to pose a couple questions to you. Okay. Um, one is short and one is longer. One is, I'm going to pose them both at the same time. One is, um, uh, to whom was, well, what's your intended, your envisioned audience 
for the book? Who was it written to primarily? And uh, the second question is, can you have healing in a white supremacist system? I am thinking of Frank Wilderson's work on Afro-pessimism right. that discusses the ways things like police brutality is baked into the system that does not recognize black people as being imbued with the same rights are extended to whites. Can we have healing in such a white supremacist uh, society that discounts, by definition, discounts black humanity? Yeah. No, great questions. The first one, um, you know, clearly I'm writing, I, you know, I'm writing from black people to everybody else outside of our experience. So black people are all, you know, it's not that the book is not for us. It is the pain I express. I want you to vicariously feel what I'm feeling. I want you to say when you read my book, as you have done tonight, graciously, that that, you know, tapped something in me, that touched something in me, that that expressed my trauma. That was a cathartic moment. Mm -hmm. I want that to happen, but I want white people to feel the pain and the trauma of what we endure. Yes. If I wanted to be as poetic as I could be, whatever the limits of my talents were, I want to put on that page uh, an evocation of our experience. Well, you did it. You did it too, brother. Thank you, sir. And, you and I wanted them to feel that deep and join it to some creative intellectual insight. So, you know, whosoever will, mm. uh, as they say, I want to read that. Now, in terms of Frank Wilderson and in terms of Afro pessimism, look, I get that. I get it with ta Coates. Um, I get it with Wilderson, and I have a deep and profound respect for Afro-pessimism, because sometimes, you know, the opposite of pessimism is optimism. And as you know, Reinhold Niebuhr is the one who made the distinction. Reinhold Niebuhr said that optimism is a shallow virtue, mm -hmm. but that hope is a deeper virtue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to match Afro-pessimism, which is legitimate, the beauty of Afro-pessimism is that it rubs up against white supremacist optimism, right? Mm -hmm. Or white optimism and a white imagination that mm -hmm. is happy because it's happy go darky. It's at the expense of black bodies. Mm -hmm. so Afro-pessimism reminds us, pulls the covers off of the white supremacist imagination because black people have been the literal technology and instrumentation of the white imagination. We are literally the techne, mm -hmm. the technological articulation of the white imagination. Our bodies, our limbs, we were the extension of hoeing in the fields, tilling the grounds and the collective unconscious. Look at a kind of neo Freudian analysis of the collective unconscious of America, what they couldn't admit our bodies told the truth about. Mm -hmm. So they projected mm -hmm. it onto us. However, in terms of Afro-pessimism, where I would probably part ways ultimately is the fact that even with all of this uh, new kind of ethnographic uh, uh, studies that says hope can be bad for you mm -hmm. because if you hope too much and then the system turns out differently than you hope for, then you jacked up. But if you were an Afro-pessimist to begin with, you mm -hmm. wouldn't have too much that you expected. I get that, I dig that, but I think we have to put up a dark hope Mm. darker hope in a beautiful, powerful way, an, an informed way. Out of darkness, creation comes, right? We could talk about ex nihilo and all these theories about how the world came into existence, but a beautiful dark hope says our darkness matches the darkness we confront, the hopelessness we confront. When the Bible says hope against hope, that's a war. That's a cosmic war reduced to the conflict between a vision of what the world should be and another one, hope against mm -hmm. hope. And mm -hmm. our hope has often outlasted mm -hmm. everybody else's. That's why Howard Thurman said, you can, you can do two things. You can become a prisoner of the event that you confront. Mm -hmm. He said, what's before? He said, our slave foreparents refused the temptation to scale down their dreams to the event they confronted. So what's before you mm -hmm. cannot exhaust the infinite capacity of imagination to project into the future. Yeah, so against yeah. Afro-pessimism, I would put Afro-imagination, right? Uh, the Afro-hope, the, Af the creative hopefulness of Black possibility. That's mm -hmm. why next mm -hmm. is to me so important. Mm -hmm. uh, Afro-pessimism may at some points stop the progress and process at a particular level. I say, and I understand, but to me, hope will exhaust that. Hope will mm -hmm. reduce that. So, so I, yes, what you know, when we ask, 
in a white supremacist society, can we find healing? We have. Mm. That, that ain't no theory. Mm. That's what we have done. Let's listen to Kind of Blue in 1959 and go read Farrah Jasmine Griffin's brilliant interpretation of that album mm -hmm. in her book mm -hmm. um, that, that is astonishing. So Love Supreme, where do you think Love Supreme comes from? Yeah. And, and, and here's the irony to me. Those of us who have not experienced the bitterest manifestation of white supremacy ask the question as to whether we can survive it when the folk who survived it, we're ignoring. Wow. <laughs> the wow. evidence, we are ignoring the empirical verification of its survival. The, yes. The mirror. The yeah. mirror is the manifestation. Yeah. The yeah. 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 I mean, you can go, go to the barbershop. To the old men in the barbershop, sitting around the barbershops, right? <clears throat> you know, uh, with their their straw hat in the winter time and their their plaid shirt, polka dot tie, and overalls, they are the men. They they're the answer right. to that. So right. this will never be a perfect society. Will I think will always be be forced. The human condition will always be for, faced with some uh, some some manifestation of white supremacy. Yeah. But you know, we keep keeping on and. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Brother, it is so good to have you here. I like to, you know, folk, this book, I'll tell you, I don't know if it shows up backward or not, but awesome. Long Time Coming by Dr. Michael Eric Dyson is an extraordinary, extraordinary book. Brother, it is always so good to have to have you here. Um, I want to tell you, folks, I mean, get ready for a ride. You pick this book up because it will open you up, open your heart up. It'll, it'll make you feel things you don't want to feel, but it'll make you see things that you have to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been so good to have you, brother. It's been Thank so good. So much, At some point, I'd like to be able to talk to you about, what did you call it? The, uh, the You talked about Je Jesus' seven last sayings oh, and what yeah. they had to do with, with Black suffering. <laughs> we can't talk about that now. Right, but right. at some point, folks who read it, it's brilliant. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank Dr. you. Dyson. Thank you. I couldn't have a better interlocutor, somebody who read the book thoroughly from, as they, the old folks say, kibber to kibber. I appreciate <laughs> you so much for that. It, it's a real honor to have such an extraordinary intellectual like you doing it. And thank you so much, my man. Thank you. For thank this you, time. brother. God bless you. God bless you. And uh, I guess that is it for the night. Um, we look forward to seeing you. Thank okay. you so much, Sister Sharon. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Dr. Professor Fair Jasmine Griffin, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Professor Oprah Hendricks. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, brother. God bless. Everyone, good night. Take good care. Good night.